Good morning, everyone. Thank you, and apologies for the late start here. We had some technical difficulties, but we are now ready to roll. Before I call this meeting to order, I do want to note that we do have language interpretation services. This meeting um, will have audio in English and in Spanish. Even if you can hear me now, in order to have good audio quality throughout the meeting, um, and if you wish, please make sure you select your preferred language. If you go down on your screen, there is a button called Interpretation. Click on that, and then select either English or Spanish. I will now pause and let the interpreter relay these instructions. And since the interpreter is on another line, I'll go ahead and do the interpretation today, Chair. Uh, buenos días y gracias por acompañarnos este día en la Junta del Consejo de Relaciones Laborales y Agrícolas. Hoy tenemos servicio de interpretación en el español. Para poder escuchar en español, deben de mirar hacia el abajo de la pantalla donde se encuentra un glóbulo. Allí haga clic y elijan español. Aunque vayan a escuchar nada más en inglés, por favor, elijan inglés, que les va a poder escuchar todo de la junta. Gracias. Thank you, Santiago. It is now 10.13, and I am officially calling this meeting of the Agricultural Labor Relations Board to order. First, I will call the roll. Board Member Broad. Here. Board Member Hall. Here. 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 Board Member Flores. Present. Board Member Lightstone. Present. Wonderful. Also present today is our Executive Secretary, Santiago Avila Gomez, who is providing technical support. We'll start today with the open session portion of our meeting, and then prior to going into closed session, we'll provide an opportunity for public comment on any portion of the meeting. Members of the public who have contacted the board, either by email or phone, and asked to be placed in the public comment queue will be called on in the order received. If you did not previously indicate you wish to make public comment, that's fine. Just please indicate by doing so in several ways. You can either email Santiago, and his email address is available on our agenda, which is also available at alrb.ca.gov on the homepage. You can raise your hand using the chat Zoom feature to raise hand, or message Santiago in the chat, and we will then call on you. Please note that we ask that you use the chat feature only to indicate that you wish to make a comment or if you're having some kind of technical difficulty. Substantive comments made in the chat will not be made of the public record. If, if applicable, please share your name and organization so we may include it in the record of today's proceedings. If you wish to speak more than once, just alert staff and have your name placed back in the queue. And if you're having technical difficulties, we will do our best to address those and make sure we can hear your comment or receive your comment. We do have limited capabilities for managing participation during the meeting and during the public comment period. So we're asking everyone who is not speaking to please place their phone or Zoom on mute and wait to unmute until you are called to speak. These instructions are also available on our agenda, again, on our homepage at alrb.ca.gov. Okay, moving on to our next agenda item, which is to approve the previous meeting minutes. Um, may I have a motion to, to approve, approve the meeting minutes, minutes from February 8th? 2023. Great. So, thank you, Isidore. May I have a second? Second. Thank you, Simone Flores. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Okay, next, going on to um, the chair's report. First, I want to take a moment to acknowledge the Californians up and down the state, particularly um, the farm workers who have been impacted by the recent storms over the past few months. I've lost count of how many atmospheric rivers have hit the state, but we have been closely monitoring this issue um, and particularly following the situation in communities like Planada and more recently Pajaro, which have displaced many Californians, including farm workers. Several members of the administration and I, including Labor Agency Deputy Secretary Sebastian Sanchez and Carlos Rodriguez at EDD, have been participating in meetings multiple times a week to support the state and federal response to these incidents. We are looking for opportunities to information share, provide a worker-focused perspective, lift up farm worker voices, and leverage opportunities to provide outreach regarding resources for these communities. To those community partners in the area, if you have input or feedback you think needs to be addressed, please do not hesitate to reach out to myself or other um, staff members in the administration, and we will do our, our best to make sure that the, that feedback um, goes to these various task forces. Um, I've lost the connection to the MI staff. I don't know if folks can hear you. Um, I'm going to ask staff. Uh, okay. okay, thank you. All right. <clears throat> Moving on to the next item, um, last week the ALRB was proud to sponsor the UC Davis Farm Labor Conference. 
This is an annual event that unfortunately has been on hiatus since 2019. It was wonderful to meet with a cross-section of agricultural industry representatives, labor advocates, farm worker advocates, immigration experts, and representatives from other state agencies and the federal government to discuss current trends, trends in farm labor. Multiple members of the ALRB had the opportunity to provide presentations, including myself, as well as um, our general counsel, Julie Montgomery, and it was a real treat to um, get to spend that time together again. I also want to um, take a moment to acknowledge um, next week is our last week with Judge Jay McCarrick. He served the ALRB for several years, and I wanted to thank him for his service and congratulate him on his well-deserved retirement. Um, we will definitely miss him, and I just want to um, share that comment. All right, our next that concludes the chair's report for today. Our next agenda item is the executive officer's report on elections, unfair labor practice complaints, and hearings presented by executive officer Santiago Villa Gomez. Santiago. Thank you, and good morning, chair and members of the board. Thanks to everyone here in person. Uh, for today's report, oh, I first want to mention that this report, along with the other reports that will be referenced today, are available on the ARB's website on the landing page, as well as on the uh, meetings tab. Essentially, all of them are in the meetings tab, so it's the easiest place to get them. Uh, that's all I'll say about that. For folks in the room, there's one report missing, and it is available online. All right, turning to complaints, there was one withdrawn, and it was at B&H Flowers, Inc., case numbers 2022, CE052, and, and that was filed on March 17th, and it was regarding the matter that had been settled back in October of 2022, wherein the parties entered into an informal bilateral settlement agreement. Turning to board decisions on February 21st, the board issued the Ball of Farms of Salinas LLC, case number 2021 CE018SAL, and that involved the commodity of cannabis in Monterey County. And there is an opportunity for a petition for writ of review that is due on March 23rd, tomorrow. Finally, turning to pending matters, two matters are pending before the board. The first, Darwin Farms, Inc. 2012-CE-041-VIS, that involved a make whole specification relating to the board's decision in 44 ALRB number one. The ALJ decision issued on January 20th of this year, exceptions filed on March 3rd, and replies are due, if any, March 24th, and that would uh, conclude the briefing in that matter. Finally, Trifanuki Farms, 2013-CE-008-VIS and 2013-CE-014-VIS. That also is a make whole specification involving the board's decision in 40 ALRB number four, and involves two requests for special permission to appeal that were filed first on March 8th, the second on March 14th, and the briefing there is completed as of yesterday. That concludes my report. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Santiago. Um, our next agenda item is the litigation report. We do not have any updates, so we will turn to the following item after that, the general counsel's report with general counsel Julie Montgomery. Julie? Good morning, everyone. Good to see, see you all. So I'm going to report, as usual, on our some settlements that the general counsel program has received and or has achieved, as well as some of our outreach that we have been conducting in the regions. So to start with settlement, we have settled two cases just recently. One was a charge filed against Tissue Grown Corporation, and that involved an agricultural worker who was performing general labor for various crops in Ventura County who filed a charge claiming that Tissue Grown had retaliated against her by changing her work conditions and laying her off because she and her coworkers spoke up about unfair work assignments and how they were being treated by supervisors. And this worker had also previously filed a complaint with the ALRB. And so she alleged she was being retaliated against for that as well. 
the ALRB and Tissue Grown did enter into a pre-complaint settlement allowing ALRB agents to distribute and read a notice to all the agricultural employees at the company, posting the notice for 60 days and mailing notices to all the employees uh, who worked there from September 19th, 2022 to present, which I, I think the, the charge was filed earlier last year. So it's, it's just a few months old, this case. Um, and then also, uh, the ALRB is going to conduct a one hour training to all the supervisory employees regarding their responsibilities under the Agricultural um, Labor Relations Act. And there is no back pay in this case, uh, as the, the worker was, was not owed any back wages. So just to this reason, I didn't mention that, but, but the other remedies will be enforced. Our staff also achieved a settlement with Another charge, um, Santa Barbara's finest LLC and 805 harvesting, and this is case number 2022-CE034-SAL. So that was filed, again, sometimes like, I think somewhere in the middle, middle of last, last year. And this involved an agricultural worker who harvested and trimmed cannabis in Santa Barbara County who alleged that Santa Barbara's finest and 805 harvesting retaliated against her and others by failing to recall them to work and refusing to rehire them because they had complained about not receiving rest periods and about unpaid wages. The employer allegedly tried to discourage the charging party and others from exercising their protected rights by saying that they would get in trouble for filing claims against the company because they were paid in cash and they threatened that the workers would get in trouble. Um, the, AS, the ALRB and the employer did enter into a pre-complaint settlement to pay seven discriminatees $11,180. And uh, this company did permanently close its agricultural operation. So our remedies were a little more limited in this case. Uh, we weren't, aren't able to do the, the reading and usual reading and noticing remedies, but the settlement agreement does hold that if they resume operations or reopen within a year of executing the settlement agreement that the ALRB will effectuate those remedies. And, um, and, and, and we'll be able to, to notice those workers. So those are the two settlements we've achieved. And so kudos to, to the teams who worked on that uh, to, to resolve these Salinas region cases. Regarding outreach activities, um, because we haven't had a board meeting for a while, uh, there's quite a lot here, but our staff has been very busy as, as many, many know, we, we have four outreach staff in our regions who've been busy coordinating uh, events, but also a lot of the outreach is conducted by, by our regional office staff as well. So we did two, um, Facebook Live and radio television uh, appearances. One was for Radio Indígena in Oxnard. Uh, our staff was interviewed in a program called Empoderando la Comunidad, which in English is empowering the community. And that was on March 2nd. And then on March 3rd, our staff was interviewed on Radio Bilingue's Calendario Comunitario program, which is community calendar program in the Central Valley. And our staff did a lot of trainings and presentations to nonprofit community-based organizations, which is an important part about outreach is they really are the direct link to, to many of the workers in the communities uh, that we serve. And so it's really important to have, uh, have good communication with them and to ensure that they know who we are and, and what, what rights we enforce. So we uh, conducted a, a, a virtual training or Latino service providers group in Santa Rosa and Sonoma County, uh, a virtual training to Senator Ana Caballero's Senate team and staff members, and that was on February 15th. We also provided a training in Spanish to volunteer leaders of Lideres Campesinas uh, in various Central Valley committees. We conducted an in-person staff training presentation to Centro Binacional para el Desarrollo Indígena Oaxaqueña, which is CBDIO, or the, the letters, uh, the acronym in Fresno. We also uh, conducted an in-person training to a group called CONNECT, which is 
Cutler Orosi Network for the Needs of Education and Community Teamwork, which is a collaborative in Tulare County uh, hosted by the school district out there in Cutler Orosi. And we today, our staff is scheduled to provide a virtual training to community organizers of the Dolores Huerta Foundation in the Central Valley. So they've been very, very hard at work doing a lot of trainings. Uh, and that's just to CBOs. We've also been training workers and doing outreach to workers. Uh, our staff presented in Spanish with Misteco interpretation at a Foro Comunitario community forum hosted by Mike Hop in Santa Maria. An in-person worker training in Spanish with the Mistec with Misteco and Zapotec interpretation hosted by CBDIO out of Greenfield in Monterey County. We did an in-person worker training in Spanish to participants of the ESL class at the Cutler Orosi Family Education Center in Tulare County. And uh, in-person worker presentation in Spanish for residents at the Benito Farm Labor Center and affordable housing in the city of Soledad in Monterey County. Um, we also had staff conducting office hours regularly uh, with CAUSE and MICOP, two nonprofits in Santa Maria, and also Poder Popular, which is in the city of Santa Paula. Um, and we, we met with various collaboratives and uh, service providers as well for stakeholder meetings, which I won't, I won't go into. Um, and then our staff was present at a, at a lot of different community events, ma distributing materials and giving information to workers. Uh, they were in Watsonville at the Oaxacan Community Shed, Calexico for a worker pickup point with EDD. They were in Porterville with the Mobile Mexican Consulate. They went to Fallbrook to talk to the workers who were affected by the shooting at the nursery and do outreach to those workers um, in that community. Uh, they were at a SWAT meet uh, in Oxnard and also attended Oxnard Sierra's open house event um, to do some outreach. They were at a METRA conference in Santa Rosa. They were at the Mobile Consulate in Salinas. They were at a Mixteco resource fair in Napa, Mobile Consulate in Merced. They were in Soledad, Soledad doing um, outreach at farm worker housing and employment resource fair. They were in the city of Fulton in Sonoma County at the Fulton Labor Center. They were in Imperial County. They went on a caravan with the labor commissioner and went around the fields to do outreach uh, with a collaborative group of, of sister agencies and departments. They were in Santa Paula at the International Women's Day event. And they were also in Dinuba with the mobile consulate. So as you can see, there's there's been a lot of outreach. I mean, really, springtime is is a good time to get out there and remind workers of their rights um, as they're gearing up for peak season, peak harvest in a lot of areas uh, so that they know when they when they need help, they they can come to the ALRB and they know who we are and they're seeing our faces out in the community. So kudos to our our staff for all their great work. And this is just a testament to the, I think, the, the importance of having our outreach staff on board and making sure that uh, word does get out because people are not going to assert their rights and enforce their rights uh, if they don't even know they exist to begin with and they don't even know who to go to or where to call. Um, and so by getting out there and doing this work, we're, we're laying groundwork for folks to, to just know where they can go for help when they need it. So thank you. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much to the general counsel and also um, want to echo the gratitude to the staff for all of that great work, particularly um, our Indio staff that made themselves available so quickly to go to the event in Fallbrook to assist those workers um, at a really critical time. Really, really appreciate that. And thank you so much for your service. Um, one thing that I was uh, derelict in mentioning that I was reminded of in Julie's presentation is um, the ALRB is now as updated its social media, and I'm going to ask Santiago to share um, the handles for our Facebook account, which has been up for a while, but also our Twitter and Instagram are live as of um, yesterday. And so for those of you who want to get the latest information, um, please make sure to follow those on the respective social media accounts. Okay. Um, any questions for my colleagues on the general counsel's report? Okay. Um, 
And next we have our legislative report. We do not have any updates at this time, so we'll move on to our regulations agenda, and I will turn it over to the subcommittee for their update um, regarding unfair labor practice charge disposition timeframe. Um, member Broad, Member Light. Hi. Yes, can everybody hear me? Okay. All right. So um, just to set the table a little bit, where we last left off <laughs> a year ago, a little over a year ago, um, as part of um, our then consideration of um, our regulation package, which was under consideration at that point and has now actually been completed, we considered but did not move forward with a regulation that would have set a time limit on um, the time between the filing of a charge and the issuing of a complaint. Um, we decided as a board that we would monitor the situation. And uh, in the meantime, we have um, been receiving data to compile um, as to sort of how investigations are progressing and the time at which they're concluded and action is taken on a case, um, either to dismiss the charge or there is a settlement or a complaint is issued. Um, we decided that we would um, look at that and then reconvene in a year, our subcommittee, to look at where we were and to evaluate any recommendation we have about what to do next on this question. Um, before you, uh, our general counsel's office has submitted a, um, a memorandum to us um, dated March 14th about this question, sort of what the status is on this issue. Um, so I would, I think the first thing we should do is ask uh, our general counsel, Julie Montgomery, to speak about it and uh, give her impression. And then uh, I can kind of discuss what uh, Ralph and I have been thinking about the issue, and then we can sort of open it up to discussion. So, Julie. Sure thing. Thank you, Member Broad. I'm happy to, to review this uh, with everyone. So, what we did is we looked at data from our investigations over the past two calendar years in addition to the last three fiscal years just to see how it compares in terms of the length of time that investigations were pending during these these time frames so when i say a pending investigation what i mean is a case where a charge has been filed and the regional office staff is investigating the claims, the allegations. Is that's that's how our process works, right? People file a claim, they say my there was a violation. We have to look at it and decide whether or not there's evidence to support that claim. And, and that can sometimes lead to a long and time-consuming investigation. And I won't go into all the reasons why. I, I know we discussed that, what, last year or the year before sometime as to why, why some of these investigations are lengthy and for reasons that are out sometimes out of our staff's control. For example, if we have to go to court and enforce subpoenas and the like. So, um, but really just looking at the length of time of our investigations and trying to figure out how to address those timeframes, we have made some changes. And some of those changes are that we centralized our data tracking out of Sacramento so that we have analysts looking and tracking data more, more centrally rather than by region. We have also improved our review procedures for work product so that we have a more centralized review process so that um, things are less likely to get bottlenecked uh, or we're reducing the bottleneck time frames. And uh, so I think we've, we've definitely improved our procedures with that. And, and we've also set uh, expectation clarify or I should say set and clarified expectations for the regional office staff and been more uh, we we've we've just really emphasized 
setting deadlines and and meeting deadlines and that that those are all changes that we've made in the past i i know i'd say since all 2021 and and i do believe that we have seen improvements that are a direct result of some of those changes so for example in the the memo that i provided we looked at investigations for these different time frames and and again these are only cases pending in investigation before we've made a decision about whether a violation occurred so it doesn't include cases that have gone to complaint or um, or whatever happens to a case after the investigation is completed. This is only looking at the time frame during which the investigations are happening and pending. So between the years 2021 and 2022, we actually um, we we resolved in 2021 we resolved 39 percent of our pending cases. Uh, that were an investigation um, or, or resolve the investigations for 39% of cases. Um, and that number jumped to 52% in 2022. So, so there was definitely a percentage increase in the percentage of cases. And, and when you look at the total numbers too, we resolved 56 of those pending investigations in 2021 and 83 in 2022. Uh, and also between 2021 and 22, we we made a significant dent on, in resolving old investigations. So cases that were pending for two years or more, we we resolved. While we were only resolved seven of those in 2021, we resolved 20 of them in 2022. So that that was a significant jump. We also, when you look at uh, this data by fiscal year, we we resolved um, between fiscal year 2020 to 2021, um, we had resolved 33% of our pending investigations. And in fiscal year 2021-22, we resolved 56%. So, so there are improvements over time just in terms of the percentage of investigations that were um, completed and, and resolved. And of course, resolution could be a complaint was filed, a settlement was reached, uh a dis we issued a dismissal or or a party withdrew and we accepted that withdrawal so those are the ways in which cases can move out of investigation um so yeah so even though certainly we still have have more work to do and need to continue improving and refining our procedures to um continue to, to be as efficient as possible to get our cases out of the investigative phase as, as quickly as possible while still doing a quality quality job, uh, where I think we have made some headway with some of these changes. And so I'm encouraged, and I know the staff has been working really hard, the regional directors and the deputy general counsel have been very diligent in, in following up with folks and really emphasizing the need to, to, to hold to deadlines and, and set uh, set priorities for folks. And, and I'll just mention that we've certainly been not been without our challenges during during the past year or so. We, we had our, our regional director in Visalia, Chris Schneider, who'd been there since he started just a little bit after I did, I think uh, in 2016. And he retired at the end of 2021. And uh, we filled his position in May of 2022, but unfortunately, that person left in February, uh, February of 2023. So we're back to, to needing to recruit another regional director. Regional director. So it has certainly been challenging to try to train and onboard a new regional director, just to lose them some months later and having to start over again. But despite that setback. Um, and, and some staff turnover as well. Uh, we, we did have to hire and onboard 11 staff in the past year. So despite the, those setbacks, we did um, still see an improvement in the percentage and the number of investigations that we resolved. And just going forward, I just wanna say that that uh, the regional director and I and, and our deputy general counsel were, were very committed to continuing to find ways to uh, increase 
the, the effectiveness and efficiency of our investigations. And, and we're going to be through our strategic planning process as well, just looking at, okay, what, what changes do we need to make and how can we um, get even better? And, and we're, we're gonna be looking at our goal setting and, and deadline setting as well to see in, in what ways we need to adjust that to, uh, to, to continue to stay on track and, and improve over time. Um, thank you very much. Um, so let me uh, kind of, uh, uh, describes sort of the, the, sort of the feelings that Ralph and I have in discussing this as a subcommittee. Um, first, it's clear that the the backlog of these very old cases that were in the investigation stage for years sometimes that that has shrunk significantly, and that's of course a very good thing. Um, statistically. You know, I'm not a statistician, Ralph's not a statistician, but statistics are complicated in that um, they are, they look great, or, or you can draw conclusions from them over long trend periods where there are not changes in the variables that make them up. We have a sort of relatively short period that we're looking at since we started looking at this. And we have one big variable that changed, which was the, the, COVID, uh, the COVID situation. Now, the consequence of that was that, um, or the consequences to our cases, was that the number of charges filed dropped significantly. So what, so we, it, it's a little bit hard to know what to make of what that means and what that means for expectations of on investigations. Um, on the one hand, people were dealing with COVID, which meant that getting responses from people over all sorts of issues got more complicated and lengthened. And we were dealing, if we all recall, with new things all the time. It's now things that we remember, but at the time it was like, well, what? You know, when are, what's happening in terms of going to work? What's happening in terms of, um, of working from home? What's happening in terms of communications with the outside world and having meetings and where can you have meetings under what circumstances and so on? So it created a lot of uncertainty. Um, uh, and, and so I don't know what, 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 I guess we don't know what the expectation should be. Theoretically, I suppose if a lot of fewer charges are filed, then it should be then resolving those charges. Um, the investigations would go quicker because the workload would go down. Maybe. I mean, you can't say for sure. So when we look at all this, we think what our general view is that we've had significant progress. We really appreciate the effort that the general counsel and her staff have made in this area. We are cognizant of the challenges they face because for example, when somebody leaves and it's their case, then a whole new person has to pick up that case and start all over in a sense in many ways. So, um, so there's all kinds of challenges managerially that have to be dealt with. Um, so we really appreciate the effort the general counsel's office has made. That said, we think that we, our recommendation would be that we continue to monitor this, that we look at it again in a year and say, you know, okay, now that a little bit more time has passed, what does the trend look like? Um, is it continuing? Are cases actually being resolved quicker? Are investigations shorter now that we've resolved a lot of older cases are pending investigations shorter our general view is that we would like to see investigations resolved you know under a year something like that would be maybe less than that on average so that they um so that uh, farm workers who file these 
cases are not in limbo about where their case is going to be. So that's our general view. And I guess at this point, I would just open it up uh, or turn it back to the chair to open it up for um, discussion by the full board. Thank you, um, Board Member Broad, and also to our general counsel. Do any of my colleagues have any other comments? I had a few um, <clears throat> comments. Um, so I want to echo um, Board Member Broad and the subcommittee's comments about the gratitude and the appreciation and, frankly, the respect that we have for the general counsel and her team. Um, through the course of this issue and through our general work together, I know that the general counsel um, has a deep um, respect for this work, is incredibly dedicated and committed, and um, from my vantage point, runs a good ship. So um, I was really appreciative of her collaboration and um, her attention when Board Member Broad introduced this issue um, through the regulatory process uh, over a year ago. And I'm very appreciative of the ongoing discussion and thoughtfulness that she and her team and the staff have staff have done one to look at this on a case by case basis, um, but also how can we look at this holistically? What you know we do have um, not a severe amount, but there was a, a somewhat um, a not insignificant amount of cases that that seemed to um, be taking over two years, which from my perspective was um, that's where my concern started to grow. Um, as we've discussed this over this past year, um, one thing that I found heartening was there was no one systemic issue, um, which was a good indicator that there wasn't, there's not something, um, you know, going on with uh, the general counsel's program. It's a variety of issues. Um, so while there wasn't one significant issue of concern, that made it a harder problem to tackle, as I understand it. Uh, as others have mentioned, there are a variety of factors such as, you know, some cases have complex factual and legal issues, there's staff turnover, there's challenges obtaining evidence and interviewing witnesses ranging from issues related to the seasonality of this industry, the migratory nature of the charging parties, sometimes unreliable means of communications. I thought some of the staff comments during the initial regulatory board meeting um, were enlightening and I took those to heart. Um, and then in some cases, you know, it's the litigation posture and tactics of, of adverse parties in these cases that make it challenging to complete these investigations in a timely, um, in, in a timely manner in all instances. Um, and like others have said, there's no doubt that the pandemic posed additional challenges for everyone involved. Uh, additional protocols were needed to protect the health and safety of our staff, of the charging parties, workers, employers, other witnesses. Um, and that also led to delay in the event when people did get sick or had to quarantine or take care of a loved one. There's just no doubt about it. Um, and so that had a huge impact, especially during this time of review, even as we started, you know, the pandemic has dragged on, unfortunately. Um, another thing that was obvious to me was just the dedication um, of the general counsel and her team to this work and the variety of steps that they um, have taken. Uh, systemically to try and increase the efficiency of cases. And I think they've been successful in that regard, as you heard earlier today. Um, and I'm very appreciative of that. Um, and I do want to highlight a few examples that really stood out to me um, and just shine a light on those, because I think they're examples that I, I was so proud, um, so appreciative of the staff's work in these cases. One was last year in Seventh Street Farms, a strawberry case that was filed in April and by July, just a little bit over three months, the general counsel had secured a really critical settlement. They got four strawberry workers back to work and nearly $7,000 in wages owed to those workers. That was a great result um, and very fast. In the fall of 2021, um, there was a charge with some very egregious disturbing allegations by a grower here in Northern California. The complaint was filed in four months, and um, it quickly resulted in settlement prior to hearing within less than a year, uh, which was a great resolution and one that um, one that I definitely um, took notice of. And those are just a few examples um, of the highlights. And I think that, that that's, that's the trend, is that there are more cases that are being resolved, and I, I appreciate that. Um, I was a proponent of the regulation proposed by Member Broad, but I, I do take to heart and consideration 
um, the comments shared by staff and others and agree that that's not the right approach at this time. I, I approach those efforts with caution. Um, I do think guardrails could be put in place to combat the adverse consequences to workers that were shared. Um, and I certainly would not want to do anything that would hurt a worker's case or their ability to exercise their rights under our act. I argue, though, that though their rights are also injured when when cases take a long time. And I know I know others share that view. Um, and sometimes those are not within our control. You know, even if they go swiftly through our process, if cases are appealed to the Court of Appeal or the Supreme Court, those take time. If the compliance is litigated, that can take time. Um, due to the other workloads of institutions outside of our control. Um, as we've discussed in this forum and in many others, farm workers are an incredibly vulnerable workforce. It's critical that we do everything we can to provide quick redress to their claims and get them back to work and made whole. It's important for that worker, for their colleagues, and for the broader workforce. And I really do strongly believe that when we, you know, and I, I appreciate the efforts to highlight um, those those cases where we do um, have quick resolution and get um, succeed in getting good settlements and good remedies for workers, because I think that builds momentum and it builds trust. Trust, and I think our effectiveness in part hinges on trust, um, and it's a, it's a critical component. Um, you know, part of our oversight, or part of our role as the board, is to ensure oversight over administration of the act, and. These conversations have been in parallel with others, as, um, as others on this diet know, including our executive secretary and my colleagues. Um, I have uh, made additional efforts to make sure every part of our process is run efficiently as possible without compromising the quality of the work, the investigation, the review of the case, um, et cetera. And you know, I frequently, you know, I'm chatting with our executive secretary. I want to make sure that matters are scheduled within 90 days. I want to ensure that administrative decisions are issued in a timely manner, and that our review of decisions um, is heard in a timely manner. And we're constantly working to make sure that we're addressing that. Um, that being said, you know, there are parts of this, as you know, for all the reasons listed. Um, that are hard to control, that are not always within our control, or there's a unique situation. So in terms of moving forward, um, I do think we can address maybe some more, some additional goals through our strategic planning process. We've already had that conversation, or some of those conversations with our general counsel um, regarding that approach uh, and what, what she thinks would work based on her expertise and knowledge of staff and workload. Um, and my, my hope would be that the vast majority of, in terms of goals, um, that the vast majority of cases are resolved within 18 months. And I think we're, we're pretty close to that. It's just trying to get that, that chunk of cases that are taking longer than two years and just winnow it down a little bit more. Um, and so I think, you know, I would appreciate quarterly updates and, um, from the general counsel in that regard and efforts um, to address that and also note that um, to the extent we need additional training, additional tools, um, the board is eager to, to get your feedback and support you in that. Um, I've had conversations with other members of the staff about um, getting training on certain you know, forensic accounting or contracting out with various firms that um, may be helpful to aid in, um, in investigations and certainly we're working on other long-term efforts um, to improve our recruitment and retention. Um, although I know the general counsel has done a really good job of um, keeping her vacancy rate low and recruiting really talented staff, and um, I'm very grateful to that. So I appreciate the work of the subcommittee and also the work of our staff, the general counsel and her staff during um, this year of review and look forward to seeing, um, continuing to read the good stories of, of the great work that you guys are doing. Thank you. Any other Thanks. comments or questions? Okay, all right. Um, I don't believe there's any other specific action item to this, so I think we can move on to the next agenda item, which is public comment. So I will first go to the executive secretary and see if we have anyone in the queue. No one has indicated I uh, wish to make public comment at this time. If anyone in the Zoom meeting wishes to do so, please raise your hand using the chat or the features of Zoom or simply unmute and 
we can proceed that way. It doesn't appear we have public comment today. Okay. Um, the, our next item is the board will gavel into closed session. So we will um, put the participants on recess and then we'll come back for announcements after that. Thank you.
Hi, Silvana. Santiago here. Can you hear me? I think uh, I think I need to switch over to the Spanish. Hold on a second. Um, maybe I can hear you now if you speak. Okay. Yep. Nope. Yeah, no, I'm sorry, we didn't have a chance to chat before. So right now, while they're in closed session, typically they'll take about 30 minutes, 45 minutes um, at most. They might be faster than that today. Then they return, and really it's just a closing statement. So if you want to just leave your computer up to kind of listen for it in the background, you know, video off, all of that, that's fine. And it's very, very brief. And basically the chair kind of thanking folks and then... Um, uh, stating the dates for our next meetings and it takes I want to say 15 to 20 seconds and then we just log off no get yeah, exactly excellent job and and we were running behind i'm usually here 30 minutes before today it was like up to the wire fighting you know network issues etc so yes absolutely okay thank you and then i think it'll be someone else that logs off but once we log off we're done and then, um, you know, the process is I'll, I'll get the invoice from Excel later. Thank you. Bye-bye.
Santiago was graciously picking them up. I told him he had to do one more thing. Yes. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Tavana, are you there? Excellent. So go, uh, we're going to make that brief statement. Now, I'm about to admit everyone from the waiting room. Thank you. Okay, thank you. The board has now returned from closed session. Um, our last agenda item is announcements. I want to share that we, the board will be having a special meeting next Tuesday, March 28th, virtual only, um, and the agenda is posted online. And um, this is to hear uh, a, um, our first labor peace agreement complaint. Um, we were not, it was uh, filed last week and we were not able to make the 10-day noticing deadline. Um, so we are meeting next week um, so the board can convene in closed session and discuss that matter. And with that, we are now adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>